wherever you may be listening, however you may be listening, thank you so much for tuning in to another edition of the All Cardinals Podcast. My name is Don Enjoy, and joined every week by my main man, Richie Bradshaw. Before we get into the nitty-gritty, go to follow our work at allcardinals.com or sl.com slash NFL slash Cardinals. Follow our work on Twitter or X, whatever the cool kids call it, at Richie Brads 36 and at Donnie Druid. Richie, before we get into everything, how are you, my man? Well, first of all, uh, happy National Signing Day to those who celebrate and observe. So, very good day for the Sun Devils, which means I'm in a very good mood. You know, can't complain when you have a higher recruiting class in all three categories than that team down south. So, I'm doing good, Donnie. Wasn't National Signing Day like early January? And am I? There's two of them. Okay. So we're, yeah, we're, this is the early signing period. Then. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, this is your early signing period. And then you'll have, uh, I want to say it's like February is your other one. Something like that. Okay. They're, they're really close. Why Why? Why the two? Do you know? Cool. We, I don't we, know. We just go with the flow here, I guess. Whatever Whatever gets the people talking, baby. What will get the people talking is the 2024 NFL draft after the Cardinals have officially been eliminated from postseason contention following Woo! their loss. To the San Francisco 49ers in week 15. Uh, they're 3 and 11 right now, just three weeks left of football. And um, the, the whole point of this episode is kind of just forecasting that the next three weeks, where do the Cardinals go? What do they focus on? And kind of how do they approach the final end to the season? And um, draft talk has officially started in the desert if it hadn't previously. Um, as we enter week 16, the Cardinals currently have the number three pick. Uh, they are tied with the New England Patriots in record, uh, but they do have a higher strength of schedule, and that is the tiebreaker. That's why they're picking at number three and not number two. Uh, Richie, when you look at the top five, Chicago has the number one pick. It's hard to see Carolina winning another game. You have the Patriots. You have the Cardinals. Washington, who has made a very strong push after losing their last five, and then Chicago again with their own original pick, rounding out the top five um if the cardinals went out they can't go any higher than pick number 12 i believe uh just in terms of math so it, it, we're starting to narrow down where the cardinals can and can't pick um even with that houston pick kind of sitting there at number 17 right outside the playoff picture i'm still feeling pretty good about where the cardinals are at just in terms of first round draft capital they also have one second round pick and three third round picks to make six picks in the first three rounds I, I think you're sitting pretty right now. Um, when looking ahead, you have the Bears. We'll see. You have the Eagles. You're probably not going to win that game. And then you have the Seahawks in Week 18, who are probably going to be fighting for the it, at worst playoff positioning. Um, there, there's a lot to play for. There's a lot to play for. Um, and I, I think overall, when looking at the draft capital, you got to be pretty stoked if you're a Cardinals fan with how everything's kind of played out right now. Yeah, you should be really happy. I mean, just your pick alone is going to land you uh, three picks inside the top, like, 70. Or, like, yeah, about the top 70. You're going to have three picks that high. You're, or four picks, because I forgot you have two first-round picks. You're in a very good position here to be able to add some really good talent. And as we've talked about many a times on this podcast, this is a really good draft class to be able to have multiple picks and early-day picks as well. They're going to be in a very good spot. You have to be really happy with where you're at right now. Like you said, with the Panthers in New England, it's going to be difficult for either of them to win a game for the remainder of the year. Same for the Cardinals, quite frankly. Um, it's This feels like an unofficial top three right now, but it also feels like a very realistic top three. The good news if you're the Cardinals is the first two picks ahead of you are going to be Caleb Williams and Drake May in whatever order that might be, which gives the Cardinals, you know, the entirety of the rest of the board for, you know, non-quarterback, which means you could go Latu Latu. You could go everyone's favorite route for Marvin Harrison Jr. Maybe you go Malik Neighbors, uh, Olu Fashanu, Joe Alt, or Joe Alt. Yeah, there's like limitless options with blue chip caliber players here for you to take a look at having number three is great. Number 17. It's really not as bad as people think, especially because some of the, um, the top defensive players that we talked about early in the year have seen their stock dip a little bit like Jared verse and Dallas Turner could all very well be available at that pick. There's also plenty 
of corners to fancy. We've talked about Kaelin King before over at Penn State. There's no shortage of guys. And the Cardinals have some really good positioning right now. But if you do finish with the third pick, I know it's not one. I know it's not two. It's it's pretty damn good, Donnie. You can't complain with that. Now, let me let me run you through the scenario really quick. Let's say Caleb goes off the board at number one. Let's say the Bears somehow get into number two, whether it's a pick of their own or they, they end up moving up. They, they take Marvin Harrison Jr. You're sitting there as Monty at number three. Do you move out? Do you stick and do you take one of those premier offensive tackles we talked about? Like, what, what's the thought process there? So, if the first two picks are Williams and Harrison Jr., then I'm looking to see if a team like Washington, the Giants, Atlanta, and Vegas, and maybe New Orleans want to move up for Drake May because there's going to be a very high demand for a blue chip player. Like, We've talked about Caleb being a generational guy. Drake May is a very, very much a presidential talent. And what I mean by that is you get guys like this every four to five years that are like elite level players. Drake May is that. And it's there. There's no shortage of teams that need a quarterback. So the Cardinals should be fielding offers. And if you get blown away by an offer, then you need to be able to, take it and understand that sure maybe you miss out on Fashanu or Alt but maybe you move down six spots and you end up with Kool-Aid McKinstry or Latu Latu like and and at the same time you're adding more more draft ammo for yourself yeah. so to me I see if I can move down I wouldn't move more than like five picks down I still want to be inside the top 10 for sure. And I want to be able to add future assets. Like if Atlanta calls me to move from three to 10 or from 10 to three, I would need a couple firsts and some other stuff to go with it. But I would still be inside my top 10, which is kind of my sweet spot. Yeah. I I think that's just kind of my logic is you should always be fielding calls, but you should get some very good calls if Drake May is on the board still. Yeah, this feels kind of similar to where they were at last year, right? Picking up number three, um, you know, there, there's a bunch of teams that potentially want to move up to try to get like that premier player. And, and right. Arizona a roster with plenty of holes will definitely take uh, more draft capital and more ammo, whatever they can get it, especially with such a premier pick too. And Richie, I'm kind of looking at the, the Texans pick right now. They're at number 17. Let's say they do make the playoffs. I mean, that pick could venture in the, the low to mid 20s, depending on how well they do. I don't necessarily think that's a bad thing, just in terms of acquiring draft capital. And I want to give a shout out to Andrew Harbaugh um, on Twitter, who had brought this point up. Shout out to Harbaugh. Um, there's probably going to be a handful of teams that want to sneak into the first round and try to get a quarterback on that, that, that fifth year option, right? Yep. What better way to capitalize on that? If if you can't do it at number three, let's say that they stick at number three and they get a guy like Marvin Harrison Jr. or maybe somebody else, um, that the the leverage you would have with a team that knows they want to go get a quarterback, knowing that fifth year option is so pivotal in the first thirty two picks, I, I think Austin Fortin can do a lot with that pick. So you know maybe not like the best draft positioning if that Houston pick does end up between like twenty to twenty five, but still plenty of. Um, plenty of avenues and plenty of navigation that Austin Fort can do up and down the draft board with that. And, you know, even like switching over on, on the other side of the coin, let's say there's a guy in like the mid teens, Arizona really covets. They can package that and maybe an early, like second or like an early third pick go up and get that guy too. There's just so many possibilities for the Cardinals. And I think that's such a great position to be in. You are in a really good position when you put it that way, because you're, Sure, you don't have two top 10 picks, which is what everybody was hoping for. But you talk about being in the middle of the first round or being in the 20s, and you have a team that's looking to move up and be able to secure a guy, like we said, on that fifth-year option. That's a great opportunity for teams. I don't don't even know what to speculate. That would be interested in moving up to get Michael Penix at the end of the first round to be able to get J.J. McCarthy at the end of the first round and have that fifth-year option. And it's not just quarterbacks. I mean, a team might want to come up and take a defensive player or a wide receiver 
like Carolina could very well be interested in moving up to the to the twenties, even though they don't have a ton of assets. But I mean, if like Roma Doomsday Doomsday was around at that point, I don't know why you wouldn't want to move up and put Doomsday on that offense. Like that that leaves you in a good position for teams wanting to move up to secure those fifth year options. It's very important to teams. And for what it's worth, I think the Titans will end up regretting not moving up for Will Levis, but that's totally irrelevant. It just kind of crosses my mind all the time, but having that fifth year option, very, very important. hundred percent. I do want to switch this topic of conversation to the field. Three games left Um, as a Cardinals fan, as a Cardinals staffer, player, coach, whatever um, you, you really want to see, I guess like, progress might, might be kind of underselling it a little bit. Um, the next three weeks are going to be very vital for the Cardinals evaluation period of maybe who should stay, maybe who should go uh, in 2024, maybe getting a good idea of who can do what and, you know, the, the systems underneath guys like Nick Rallis and Drew Petzing. So I, I did highlight um, three things personally I'm watching the, the evaluation of. Number one is Kyle Murray. I mean, I, I think – quarterback talk to Arizona and the draft is put the bed for the time being. I want to see him get as many reps in his new offense as possible. I want to see him get his feet settled a little bit more in, in, in his new role as the, the quarterback. I really want to see him kind of flex his knowledge and just, I already said it, but like the reps are such gold in the NFL. The more you can get, the better, especially in a brand new offense. And I really think that the Cardinals plan on being maybe that sneaky surprise team in 2024 they're really going to need Kyler to know this offense and the playbook like the back of his hand and more reps with Trey McBride, more reps with maybe a handful of other guys who do plan on coming back next year. I think the next three weeks, although they're not playing for anything, Kyler pretty much already cemented himself as the guy. The next three weeks are going to be huge in terms of how much more familiar he can get with this new offense. It's very important, like you said, to be able to get those reps in and to be able to understand a new offense, especially when you consider he missed the off season, he missed OTAs, he missed a lot of training camp. Like he really comes in mid season and has to learn this thing on the fly. It's going to be pivotal that he continues to get those in game reps. It's very different from working out in OTAs and spring ball and whatever. Sitting on the sideline and getting those mental reps, which, which, are, which is good. You it's know, important he, 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 for those- sure. But it's it's not nearly the amount of weight that it has when you're going up against NFL defenses in an actual game time setting. So it is very important that the Cardinals are able to get Kyler Murray out there and you know vice versa for Kyler Murray to be on the field. Going to be very, very important as he continues to adjust to a new offense. You also got to remember he has spent the first entirety of his career in a Cliff Kingsbury offense. He gets fired. He's recovering from an ACL. Yeah, it's there's going to be a lot of growing pains. Like the only way that our previous conversation about should the Cardinals move on from Kyler Murray, the only reason he would or situation he would have is if he threw like zero touchdowns against 10 picks, then yeah, you're probably moving on from him. But if you went in understanding there's going to be some ups and downs here, then yeah, this is about what you would expect. But having those reps in game reps, not mental reps, not practice reps, in game reps going to be pivotal for the future of Kyler Murray, because you probably are going to evaluate him in 2024 and figure out what to do from there. Moving on. I'm watching the rookies really closely here because the Paris Johnson got off to a really good start to the season, uh, maybe dipped a little bit, but he's starting to really pick it back up as of late. Um, You're looking at a guy like DJ Ojolari who took, uh, took a little, at, at the start of the year, kind of find his footing, um, has really come on as of late. And then, like, other guys like Garrett Williams, I mean, Keetro Clark, Michael Wilson. Um, I'm, I'm looking at this entire rookie class, including Jonathan Gaines, who isn't playing this year. But, um, you know, just the the knowledge of the offense, especially as, as a center, um, is going to be huge for him potentially moving into 2024, depending what happens with Yalde Froholt. Um, I, I just I, I want to see the rookies really kind of – progress right like not make the same mistake twice maybe that they would have made earlier in the season they've faced nfl level competition for almost an entire season now they know what to do they know what not to do 
can you really turn it on and kind of push yourself and put yourself in a good position to kind of make that big second year leap that we've seen a handful of really strong and promising rookies across the league do. Um, there's a handful of candidates that I think, in my opinion, for Arizona to have that happen in 2024. Uh, but I mean, to, to kind of polish off your rookie year on a good stretch, I think would do wonders for each of those guys. You definitely need to make sure that you're evaluating your first class very, very carefully. You want to see what you did correctly in your evaluations. You want to see where you need to improve in your evaluations. You want to see where you need to continue building up depth, talent, whatever at certain positions and what positions you feel confident that you addressed. You had the right guys. You can move on to different areas. You know, we've seen ups and downs this year. Paris Johnson Jr. did have some really good games. He's also looked like a rookie. What a what a concept, right. especially along the offensive line. That's a difficult position to translate to at the next level. P.J. Ojulari, up and down. Garrett Williams, up and down. Owen Popo, he's got some reps. But as a whole, you look at this, this class, Catrell Clark, there's been ups and downs, as you would expect. But you need to continue to be able to place them in positions on the football field, especially when you know you're not going to the playoffs, which we knew that going into the year. But... Now that you are, you know, mathematically eliminated, now is as good a time as ever. Get those guys on the field. See who's going to be building blocks. See who's going to be core players on the team in the depth chart. See who is simply not going to be part of the future, right? I'm not saying you cut guys after the rookie year. What I'm saying is you need to figure out where you need to improve, what you did right, what you did wrong. Getting rookies as many reps as possible is always a good thing. But now that you're mathematically eliminated from the playoffs and you got a draft coming up where you've got 217 picks, you need to be able to figure out where you need to spend all that capital on. So if BJ Ojulari completely cools off and doesn't do anything for the rest of the year, Edge is going to be high on your list. But if Ojulari goes on a tear and ends the year with eight or nine sacks, you don't feel as pressured to take a guy super high, you would be able to let the board fall to you a little bit better. This is obviously really thinking far in advance, but again, you need to have these conversations. You need to understand where to go from here. Part of that is an evaluation process with getting guys live reps, just like Kyler and trying to adjust to a new offense. Rookies are adjusting to the pro level. Get them all the reps that they could possibly get. See if they can settle in. No, I would agree. And to uh, to point out, um, 13 of those 217 picks in the 2024 draft do belong to the Cardinals. Um, so I, I'm interested to see like if they stick at that many, because like for sure they're going to move up at some point, right? Like like Austin Ford has proved to be a very active general manager whenever it comes to navigating the draft board. Um, do they move up in a second? Do they move up in a third? I'm not super sure. Moving right. on to the the third point, though, and I'm glad you brought up the, the whole pass rusher point because it really feels like um, we haven't heard Zayvon Collins' name. You had brought that up who? before we started recording. Exactly. Um, I, don't, I don't know who you're talking they, about. The Cardinals moved Zayvon Collins to the edge, maybe out of need, maybe as an experiment, maybe to see, you know, would he fit better there? Because correct me if I'm wrong, because you are much more delved into the draft than I am. Um, there was some talk of Zaven maybe being an edge guy at the NFL level because he's got the size, he's got the speed, right? Honestly, Donnie, that is the one draft I did not pay attention to. Perfect. See? Perfect, perfect, perfect. <laughs> like, okay. It, it was so funny when we're at our buddy Austin's house and watching the draft. I'm like, I don't know who that is. Oh, I don't know who that is either. And well, like our buddy Connor is like, oh, I'm happy with Zaven. I'm like, literally don't know. You could tell me where he went to school in a position and I believe you. And you could have been totally lying to my face. It was kind of odd because I thought Zaven as an inside linebacker played fairly decent last year. Um, they did lose Zach Allen. They did lose JJ Watt over the course of the last offseason. So maybe they felt like they needed to, to move from there is on, almost like an insurance policy. Maybe they thought he would thrive there. Um, thrive he is not, because we have barely heard his name. Um, out of edge rushers without the minimum snap like threshold on pro football focus, 
Um, he ranks like somewhere around like 60, like 63rd in terms of pass rushing grades. I, I don't think I was trying to find the Kyle Odegaard tweet while you were um, explaining to the very good people exactly what the Cardinals need to do in terms of their rookie class. But I mean, while I was rambling, no, <laughs> um, he hasn't produced in like the last like seven or eight weeks. I, I, I don't think he has a sack to his name in quite a while, which I don't think is on him. But like when uh, you saw it in Jack training, was you saw it in preseason almost two months ago. Yeah. Like you, there's no way he had any like pass rush moves in his arsenal ready to go. And like speed and size does not win in the NFL a lot of the time. Granted, there, there are some instances, but if, if you look at the, the top tier pass rushing guys, they have a bag of moves they could dive into at any given point. And Zayvon making that transition, I mean, was it too much to expect out of him? Did the edge experiment fail? I mean, I, I would be shocked. If looking at what he's done in 2023, granted, he's been great against the run. He has been very solid between the tackles and the, and the rushing attack. Um, he's just not putting up the the pressure or the, the sack numbers you really want out of a premier edge guy. No, not at all. And quite frankly, first of all, slam dunk, he's not getting his fifth year option picked up. I would bet 400 house payments. They are not picking up his fifth year option. Like, Tattoo it. They're not. There's no reason for them to. That's right. He's not produced, like you said. And you're not going to be paying a guy who's not producing. Sure. Maybe it's growing pains, right? Of moving from your inside linebacker spot to a full-time edge rusher spot. Sure. There could be growing pains there. But with that being said, you're a former first-round pick. You have expectations. You also are being evaluated by a new staff who did not draft you and has no ties to you. They have nothing that is saying they need to hold on to you. Hell, he could be cut in the offseason. Well, that, that's exactly me. what entered my mind because there was so much talk about Isaiah Simmons coming into this year. You right. Know, where, where would they and play what happened him? To him? Where would they utilize him? And then they saw him playing preseason. They were like, yeah, he needs to go. We don't care what we get for him, but he's got to get out of here. Yep you could do the exact same thing with Zayvon Collins because if he doesn't fit this defense, then there's no point in trying to fit a square peg in a round hole, Donnie. This is a new, young, completely learning the ropes front office and coaching staff. There's there's no point in I would trying be, to hold on to I guys if for, they don't fit. We're moving him back to the interior. I think him next to Kaiser White would be pretty solid. Sure. I'm not, uh, no, w- w- I'm not w- trying w- to w- slander guys like him BJ, too much. Guys like BJ, Dennis Gardeck, Cameron Thomas, w- with that mixture of guys, assuming you maybe add like another guy too. My J Sanders. My J, sure. When, I mean, <laughs> I think it was a good thought on paper, and I think maybe that was the Cardinals kind of swinging for the fences there a little bit, banking on the the size and the speed that Zayvon has shown on the, on the NFL field. Right. Ah, edge and interior inside linebacker. It's just two different worlds, man. And it's, it just hasn't worked. And that, that's not Zavin's fault. Um, I, I think it's more so on, on the coaching staff. But, I mean, you, you can't expect a guy like that to turn into TJ Watt. There's, there's definitely some need for patience. But I feel like you're putting it in overdrive and shifting a few gears with everything that we talked about. With what's going on with a new coaching staff with what's going on with a new fit and a new scheme. Yes. Saban probably deserves some more grace, but there's the NFL and this is a new staff and this is a business. He's not producing. They're not going to hold on to him. I'm not saying cut him, but I'm also not saying his roster spot is safe. Sure. And you know what? There's a reason why the, the NFL stands for not for long for a lot of people, right? I mean, it's, it's a very much production based business. And if you don't produce, you are out of there. Um, putting a bow on this wonderful podcast we have done for allcardinals.com. Um, I had like just three players I, I want to see to get a little bit more playing time moving into the final weeks of the season. Number one is Greg Dortch. I mean, what more do we have to do to get led deeper into the, the Dorcher chamber? He seemingly produces every time he's thrown the ball. Um, that wasn't really the case for anybody against the 49ers, but you know, and as a whole, 
as a whole. He, he has done pretty well. I think he definitely deserves more opportunity. And I think there's a conversation, Richie, that needs to be had in the offseason about whether or not he should be in the slot as the starter instead of Rondell Moore. Um, yes. So I, I, I think that would be a convo you and I and everybody Answer else has. At some point, number two, uh, inside linebacker Owen Papo, day three pick from Auburn. Um, the size, the speed. I mean, he ran like the he, he tied Isaiah Simmons for like the fastest 40 by a linebacker at four point, whatever. Um, I, I do want to see him get a little bit more time. I mean, Josh Woods just went to injured reserve. Kaiser White is on in, injured reserve. You're gonna need somebody to step up anyway. Might as well see what you have in him. And then Michael Carter. There's a lot of talk about the Cardinals' backup running back position to get, uh, to James Conner. There's a lot of talk about James Conner and whether or not the team's gonna bring him back on that. Like, is it eight million dollars in price tag? I'm not super sure. Um, We'll, we'll see what happens with him. I think Connor ultimately stays, but you definitely going to need a one B to your one a is Michael Carter. The guy, I mean, he's looked pretty solid the, the last couple of games, but you also have guys like County Ingram, Amari DiMarcado. So definitely more evaluations are going to need to be had, but I think Carter's looked pretty decent. I do want to see him get more opportunity. Uh, the final three weeks of the season. Yeah. Um, I don't know if I have too much to add to that. I think you really nailed it with, needing that evaluation we've really hammered that point home on this episode is like this is this is a new staff it's a new team there's a lot of evaluation that needs to be done it's not just about the starters anymore it's not just about the names that we know right it's not about buddha baker it's not about is there anyone else <laughs> It, it's not Jaylen, about the guys that Jaylen you know. Thompson. Yeah, Jalen Thompson, that's a good one. Who was ranked as one of the top five most valuable safeties by a pro he's football. A stud. Oh. And, and, I, and I'm tired of pretending he's, he's not. Yes. Yes. I'm tired of pretending he's not one of the most underappreciated safeties in the league. But it's not just evaluating the guys you know. It's evaluating who you don't know. It's evaluating who is kind of teetering on whether or not they are part of your future. That's where you're at. These yeah. are all guys that we're trying to figure out. Bottom line. Is it fair to, to say we fit the, the next stage of the rebuild? We we got the first year out of the way. You know you're not making the postseason. Now's really kind of the, the, the next phase in terms of evaluating what went right, what went wrong for the, the Cardinals kind of taking that into their, their next offseason. Yeah, I think that's fair. I think that's fair to say is you're getting ready to move that second step now that you have mathematically been uh, eliminated from the playoffs, now that you are getting closer to having your draft position secured, um, not just for you, but for all your extra picks as well from other teams. I think you're starting to get to that point. You're going to be looking ahead to who's getting re-signed from all the pending free agents, who's going to be moving on, all that good stuff. I, I think that'd be fair to say this is phase two. Awesome. They, they do take on the Chicago Bears. It'll be interesting to see how both of those organizations approach week 16. Obviously, the, the players and coaches are trying to win, but I mean, I don't think front Let's office personnel on either side would really kind of be too upset if they ended up losing right. uh, the week 16 game. But let's go, Bears. <laughs> let's go, we, Bears. We want that draft position, baby. And if you want that position, you got to root for the opposition. Got to root for the ops. Really quick before we go, um, me and Richie are playing each other in the I knew you were gonna bring fantasy this up. football semifinals uh, for a right to go in the championship. So good luck this week, brother. I certainly hope to play you. All right. Thank you so much for tuning in to another edition of the All Cardinals podcast. My name is Donnie Drew and joined every week by my main man, Richie Bradshaw. Go to follow our work at allcardinals.com or sa.com slash NFL slash Cardinals. Follow Richie on Twitter or X at Richie Brad's three six. Follow me at Donnie Drew. And until then, I hope most people watching this win their fantasy matchup. <laughs>